This unmarked grave that Marjorie Bates and myself are laying flowers at is like all the other unmarked graves in this cemetery. It is the final resting place of some of our people, some of our ancestors. Last week, we told you about a disease that was called consumption and would later be named tuberculosis. We talked about how it found its way into our lives and how the Charles Council Hospital was created as a treatment center for patients with TB. We also talked about how the people who had the disease were sent from their homes and families for months and sometimes years to live in these hospitals. Welcome to Swollen. I'm your host, Janine Blake. The cemetery that you've just seen is actually the end to a much larger story. In fact, it's three stories. The story of a devastating disease, the story of a hospital, and a story about our people. They were people struggling to understand a new language, a new culture, and the treatments they were receiving. In this episode of Swollen, we'll see how some of our people coped with the rigors of treatment and confinement in a hospital in Edmonton, Alberta. And ultimately, we'll discover how some of these patients never returned to their homes, but instead found their final resting place in a cemetery of unmarked graves. Our story began with the Charles Campbell Hospital and how it started its life as a Jesuit medical college, then became a veterans hospital during the Second World War, and finally, in June of 1946, it was re-established as a sanitarium for Aboriginal tuberculin patients. In the spring of 1946, the first Inuit patient was admitted to the Campbell Hospital, and by 1953, there were almost 3,000 Inuit registered in tuberculosis hospitals across Canada. Our people were sent from their homes to a place where their language and culture wasn't understood, and the treatment for TB was not only arduous, it was not easy to understand. Depending on where the TB was located in the body, you had surgery or operations to remove it. Imagine having four of your ribs removed and wax placed in your body for months. Imagine having a surgery called spinal fusion. Now imagine that you are undergoing these surgeries in the 1950s without the modern technology that we take for granted today. I went in December and April. April they operated. What kind of an operation was it? Collapse lungs. I had an operation on the set. Put all my right around, right down to here. I put my arm aside and cut some. They didn't, they found out then they didn't have to take all the ribs out there. But I think when Hilda went, she had most of her ribs out. But me, when I went, they found out they didn't have to take all my ribs out. Just three little pieces, three places I took about that much out to collapse my lung. I had a big operation there. They took four ribs out of my uh, back, four, to put my wax in, uh, inside me. You know, they don't really put you to sleep. You just kind of dope you up, but you can hear everything. I remember hearing that little saw when they cut my bone. I remember hearing that. Like two or three months, he said, uh, we, we will do a surgery on you, and what we will be doing will be a spinal fusion. So I asked, like, what, what is that? What are, what are you talking about? And he said, like, I had TB in my spine, and they will remove some of the, the parts where the TB was, and they will put a fusion in there. All patients had to follow a strict regimen that was composed of four levels. Level one was the most stringent for the most seriously ill. It was strict and total bed rest. This meant that you couldn't leave your bed for any reason. This meant that some people were kept in bed for a year or longer. Level two meant the patients could sit in a chair once a month. Most patients were happy to get to level four because they were allowed to walk for short periods. This meant that they were going home. Imagine being confined to a bed for 24 hours a day, for months or years at a time. Now imagine that this bed is in a hospital far from home, family, and loved ones. 
This relocation of our people was not only a trauma for them, but for their families as well. When we return, we'll talk about how the TB epidemic affected our people, not only their health, but their lives and their families' lives as well. thinking, gee, maybe I'm going to go home tomorrow, see my family, and then I kept thinking that, and then finally when I knew I had to stay there, I had to, you know, accept it, and I had to just uh, do as the doctor said, like, I have to stay, and I can't just walk out. So I had to listen to them, and he was happy that I, you know, I went along with them because, you know, some of them, they, they don't want to stay in the hospital and they'll ask to go. But I didn't do that. I, I just said, well, I guess I'll have to stay then. And, um, and then there was no way, we, no way we can phone home. And we don't hear from our family. And only times, you know, sometimes they would write us a little letter or send us a little parcel or and we never have chance to phone or it's not like now you can phone. So I I had to get used to it whether you know whether I liked it or not because uh, the doctor said I'll I'll be there for quite some time and then I got to know the girls there and they were going through the same thing I was. They were away from home too. Really lonely. Really lonely up there. No, good thing there were some ministers that visit you and some ladies that work for the Anglican. They come and visit you. They bring you little things just to make you happy. Mm -hmm. What did you do when you got lonely? Pardon me? What did you do when you got lonely? Can't do nothing. Just have to take it like that and you get better after. People talk to you, you're... Um, where you're staying in a room, there's six of us in one room, big room, six of us. And we talk to one another. When that woman is sad, we talk to her, make her happy. Mm. Hilda's stay was long, but there were some who stayed even longer. There are cases where mothers were away for several years and missed being with their children. There were children who grew up in hospitals away from their parents and their homes. From 1945 to the late 1950s, many of our people's lives were changed forever during the TB epidemic. They were sent from their homes to live in a hospital in the South for months and even years away from their families and friends. They underwent grueling treatments that they didn't understand in a culture that was foreign to them. But in all of this, they had strength and courage. The hardest part is when you get lonely and think of your family at home. That's it. That's the hardest part we don't, we don't like up there. But people come around, ministers come around, the Anglican women come around, talk to you, and encourage you how you're going to feel every day. Except only by prayer you can be happy. So we try and stick into that all the time, every day, makes us happy. Some people had faith. Others looked forward to getting packages from home, while others tried to visit with each other to help keep their spirits up. Mischief little girl, crazy all the time on and laugh, tease my friends, and I never worry about what went on with me. <laughs> Everyone coped with the boredom in their own way, but all needed something to occupy the long hours of tedious confinement to their beds. 
From time to time, relatives would come to visit, but it was expensive to travel. And with hospital stays that ranged from months to years, most people spent long hours with nothing to do. To deal with the loneliness, boredom, and homesickness, some of the patients began painting and sculpting, and still others made moccasins, parkies, jewelries, and other items that helped them stay connected to their homes and the land that they missed so much and was so far away. There's a lady beside me, and uh, her name is Bella Kinesi, and uh, she had almost the same thing as what I had and what I went through, so they, there were some staff there, they would, they would bring material and they would, they would ask us if we would like to sew. So right away we, we, we were anxious to sew. You know, we had something to do. Yeah. And she's, she really can draw, she really can draw nice flowers and so we start sewing. And we, I finished a pair of mucklucks, and I even had to put the moosekin on by hand. Everything was by hand. And they would pick up whatever we make, and these, there's a place where they bring all the crafts, and I guess we didn't realize that they were, there were supposed to be prizes for that, or you could win a prize. We didn't know that. And they said they, when they went through here, I, they saw my name and I won a prize on that sewing. Lonely, far from their homes and families, confined to their bed for months and in need of something to occupy the long hours, many patients needed something to do. And soon many were sharing their skills and talents teaching others. Many fine pieces of clothing were being made. Fine sculptures of drum dancers, animals, and scene from hunting and life in the north were also being made. All were reminders of homes far away. Yeah, we cut out, uh, cut out a few little things with straw, you know, and Bella would draw some little thing on there, and she'll get them to, she'll tell them how to sew this and that, and they were happy. What had started as a way of dealing with loneliness and boredom began a small industry of Inuit and Aboriginal culture. The hospital finally arranged for a gift shop on the main floor and began selling the arts and crafts for the patients. A small fee was charged for the sale and the rest of the money was given to the patients. It became a kind of therapy for the patients and nurses worked arts and crafts into their physiotherapy. However, while some survived TB and were eventually reunited with their families, there were others whose stories have a sadder ending. These are our people who lie here in these unmarked graves. These are people that didn't survive their illness and now lie here where our story first began. You may be wondering why they are here and they were not sent home. The reason is because the government decided that it would be too costly to send these people home after they passed away. These are our people who lie here in these unmarked graves. These are people that didn't survive their illness and now lie here where our story first began. You may be wondering why they are here and they were not sent home. The reason is because the government decided that it would be too costly to send these people home after they passed away. So our people were buried here. Some were given crosses to mark their spot, while others were only noted on a land plot. Wild grasses covered this area for years, and the place was all but forgotten, except by relatives who were too far away to even visit the graves of the ones that they loved. I don't know anybody that passed away. Only the one I know was Josie Patrick, mm -hmm. and they sent him home. He had a heart attack. He was read, ready to go home. He was walking around, just ready to go home. The next day, passed away. Now, we, we saw his name down there. They buried him down there in Edmonton. They did? I didn't know. I thought they'd send him home. 
They never tell us what we're going to bury this one or that one in Edmonton. They don't know the, the nobody tell them uh, nobody tell them how to look after those Eskimos that come from Aklavik or Eastern Arctic. Nobody tell them what they're going to do with them. No, they just, uh, we just stay like, live like that. They don't tell us nothing. And we don't know nothing what's going on. We just know we're there to get better and that's it. But we were treated good, really treat us good. The cemetery was left with wild grasses and old wooden crosses that began to fall over. In 1979, the area became part of the St. Albert Civic Cemetery. The city became the owner of the property with waist-high weeds, fallen and faded white crosses, and the site was left to further decay. It was impossible to put the names on each site, but when former Charles Council nursing director Elva Taylor heard about the unidentified graves, she and a city clerk for St. Albert, Fiona Daniels, joined together to raise money to erect a monument on the site. The names of those who rest here are written in Cree, Inuktitut, and English, 98 names in all. We'll leave you with this memorial that has been dedicated to the people who are buried in the unmarked graves in the cemetery. Till next time, I'm Janine Blake, and this has been Swangen.
Lord, thank you for your love for me. Thank you also for family and friends, and thank you for the gift life itself. Help me live each day for you. When you think of all that's good, give thanks to God.